All right, welcome to Can Neurotechnology Make Us Smarter? Uh, I am Peter Freer. I actually founded uh, Play Attention back in 1994. As a public educator at the time, I thought uh, I could create a system uh, using my background in physics and science and mathematics and computer programming that would help students. I was uh, fortunate enough to stumble across NASA and NASA was using neurotechnology to train astronauts to maintain a high level of performance during states of hyperarousal and hypoarousal. I adapted and enhanced what they did and created play attention after working, uh, gosh, three jobs, six days a week over the course of about uh, five or six years. Now play attention is the global leader in neurocognitive training. As a matter of fact, I pioneered neurocognitive training, which means I integrated neurotechnology with cognitive training and behavioral shaping and received patents for doing so. And then NASA was uh, excited enough about my enhancements that they invited me to speak at uh, the National Space Society on their behalf. Uh, since then, we've been featured in Time Magazine, Good Morning America, and so forth. Uh, so a wide history over the course of almost uh, uh, 26 years now, and I had started it, uh, gosh, uh, well before I started the company. The research was started five or six years before that. So probably about 30 years ago when all of this happened. So I am incredibly grateful that you are all here, and I'm excited as well because uh, you're interested in neurotechnology, which is a passion of mine. What we do want to talk about today is uh, not only can it make us smarter, but so for some of you who are just interested and really don't know what neurotechnology is, I'm going to give you a little bit of background information. Not enough to bore you, but I uh, hope enough to excite you and, and keep you informed. For those who are initiates and, and already know um, exactly what neurotechnology is, bear with me. I won't take too long to do that. What I want to start off with, and the brain is an incredible organ. It is an organ of reduction, all right? And let's talk about the organ of reduction. Uh, in other words, every time we look up at the stars, a starry night sky, every full moon we look at, every sunset we watch, every first kiss we ever had, everything we ever learned at school, everything, everything, in the brain is reduced down to the simple firing, random firing of neurons. These constituent components, these little cells that form the brain. Now the communication between these cells that you see here with all the flashing going on where they're emitting neurotransmitters, little electrochemical pulses that, that tend to talk to each other, allow the cells to talk to each other, or what make all of this happen. But it is, what it is, is our, our inner universe. This is the sum of all of us, and it's stored here. It is the most valuable asset we own. And that's the exciting part of all of this, is that we can affect change within this organ, because it is an instrument that is designed to be shaped and molded. And that is incredibly important, especially when we're talking about neurotechnology. The big problem we have with it right now is that we have no control over it, right? Uh, I know now is a very stressful period in your life and you find your brain running away with certain thoughts. What am I going to do? What is happening now? Can I be happy in the future? because the brain starts asking all of these questions. We don't seem to be able to have control over that. And when we have that kind of chatter, we watch too much news, that kind of thing, we have a, an incredible amount of chatter going on and we have no control over it. We have, when those thoughts run away, our anxiety level goes up, our productivity goes down, our happiness typically goes down and we get, I don't know, a little bit sad. Nothing wrong with it, but what if we had far better control over that and different aspects of our lives that I could become 
uh, better at whatever I wanted to do. And that we do have the possibility to do. That is what neurotechnology can enable us to do. Now we have feedback-based technologies that we use all the time. We get on our exercise bicycle, put on our Fitbit or some other um, tracking tool. We can look at our heart rate. If I get on that bike and I'm not riding fast enough, my heart rate's not high enough, it gives me instant feedback on the bike that says, so you're not moving fast enough, you need to get your heart rate up. That's a good feedback instrument, right? Fitbit does the same for me. And what if we wore one of these type of devices and it would allow us to see what our brain is doing in real time. That is what neurotechnology can provide. And I'll go into that in more detail as we move forward. But it is going to be, and I'm one of the pioneers that is going to actually make it that way so that we all can use it at any time, anywhere we need it. Just as we could put on a Fitbit that would show us our steps walked and where we have walked and heart rate, we will have a device. Right now we do have the body wave device, which is an industrial design that we use with the play attention system. But soon we'll have it in a wristband form factor so that we can have it anytime, anywhere, and show us how emotional we're getting, how much attention we're paying, how relaxed, how mindful, how stressed, and monitor it and make changes in our lives. And that is what neurotechnology provides. How do they give us control over our brains? That's the secret that I really wanna talk about right now. And uh, for again, for those of you who already are quite aware, I'll, I'll keep this brief, but for those of you who don't really understand it, let me go into detail on it for you so you do understand how we can actually alter and improve the most valuable asset we, we own, right? Uh, good, uh, a good example of this, by the way, is uh, the public's perception of the brain and how it's used and how useful it is. The brain by itself weighs maybe 2% uh, of our total body weight. So it, the brain is actually just about 2% of our total body weight, but it uses about 20% of our daily expenditure of energy. That's how important the body has designated the brain, right? The brain uses 20% of the total daily expenditure of energy out of our entire day because it is a massive processor for us, a vastly important tool. And that's important to understand. AARP, the American Association of Retired Persons, put out a survey to their clients saying, what is the most important thing to you as you grow older? And out of, I think they had about 69,000 respondents to that. And about 80% of them, one would have thought they would have said, I have to have enough money so that my uh, future is secured. But the answer was really surprising. The vast majority of people that answered that question said, I need to keep my cognitive faculties sharp because they've seen their friends with incredible amounts of money saved up for years get alzheimer's dementia and then they soon know that having all the money in the world does not save you it does not secure your future maintaining this first is the foundation of securing our future and again this is how neuromonitors what they can do. So how, how do they do this? Well, the brain is comprised of billions of nerve cells called neurons, all right? And each one of them is as a cell, just a, like a cell phone, for example. A cell phone by itself is not very useful, right? A cell phone that just is, has no energy in it, it doesn't connect to any other cell phone, any other towers, any other networks is not useful, except maybe as a, uh, perhaps like a, as a paperweight. But when that cell, cell phone, can connect to other cell phones, virtually every other cell phone in the world, it has that possibility, can ping to any tower and connect to a large network like Google or Yahoo 
and we get wealth, a uh, wealth of information coming to us and we can give it back to it. That is the function of a network. And that is how these cells work in your brain. They fire among each other and communicate among each other, just like your cell pinging a tower, which connects it to a larger network. The cells in the brain are very much the same, work very much the same way. Now to communicate among each other, they actually deliver this little pulse of uh, electrochemical energy between the cells. The cells are contiguous. They're not continuous. They don't touch, right? They're contiguous. They are right next to each other. And this gap between them has to be crossed. And so in order to communicate, thus to facilitate that, this cell will fire an electrochemical over to the next cell. And that, when you have hundreds of thousands of those firing at one time, then you have a small electrical field being generated. And the field, this is something else that many of you may not know. These fields that develop because of the neurons firing actually oscillate over the surface of the brain. And what we've found over the last four or five years is that these oscillations of these electric fields that are produced by the individual cells collectively actually communicate. The field alone is part of a communication system to other regions of the brain. So that's one way that neurotechnology works. And of course, um, by monitoring that field. But in addition to that, the cells have to talk to each other. So they're connecting along networks that are facilitated by uh, the neuroactivity, right? But the neuroactivity has a secondary feature, which is that oscillation of a field that crosses, traverses the brain, which communicates to other regions of the brain. So this is a, an incredibly complex tool that monitors that, uh, that bit of um, electricity that the brain gives off. So if, if we could actually see how much electricity uh, your brain gave off, if you hooked a 15 or 20 watt bulb up to a brain, you could, you could actually get uh, some light out of that bulb. That's how much energy is actually going on in the brain. These fields actually emit um, almost like a, uh, a, a signal that is uh, a, a wave. And I, I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible. Um, the ones that we're primarily interested in, in using this to improve performance are the delta. And delta waves are long, slow rolling waves. We know that if uh, delta is from one hertz to uh, three hertz, if, uh, if we have a dominant delta pattern going on that we can monitor, then we know that the person is asleep, just like this young person right here. In theta, theta is the twilight of sleep. It's that uh, if, if anyone here has actually been, has, has lain in bed and, uh, you're in the twilight of sleep and you've caught yourself and jerked yourself awake because you felt like you're falling. Uh, that would be a heavy theta state. You're totally detached, not really thinking about anything and in the twilight just before sleep. And that's four to seven hertz. Above that is alpha where we're relaxed and alert. And again, that's about eight hertz to oh, 10, 12 hertz, I would think. Some people take it as high as 15 hertz. Um, beta is when we're processing a lot of data. If it is dominant, then beta would be a state where we're really uh, concentrating and trying to process data from 16 to 30 hertz. 30 to 100 hertz we call gamma, and uh, that is insight, peak focus, expanded consciousness. A lot needs to be learned more about what gamma can actually provide. So these, if, if this sounds complex, let's make it something that uh, uh, we'll speak about it in a way that might, you might be able to relate to if it seems too complex. Remember when we used to have a radio station on the radio, and some of us may still have a car old enough to have it, where we could punch FM 105, right? Or FM 107.9, uh, FM uh, 101, right? And we could actually, in those days, we could punch a button or we could just turn the knob and we could turn it to that frequency. That's really the same that we're talking about here. The brain is emitting certain frequencies of signal and we can tune into them. I can tune into delta. I can tune into theta just by 
turning the knob and listening to those frequencies, just like FM 101, 102.5, and so forth down the line. I hope that makes sense. And by the way, I will take questions at the end, so uh, feel free to type them in, and I will uh, take them and try to uh, do my best to answer you. Now, when we use monitoring, we can have passive, reactive, and active monitoring. So we're looking at all of these data from the brain and we monitor it. And I have an example here in Freer Logic, another company that I started. We work a lot with the uh, automotive industry. I've created a headrest that uh, looks at your brain uh, in real time and you don't have to touch it. As a matter of fact, I do have one right behind me here. And you can see I'm about, oh gosh, about a foot away from it. And it is able to monitor my brain data without me ever knowing. It's very passive. That's passive monitoring, right? I'm a little bit too far here. It's passive monitoring. Now, passive monitoring means that nothing happens. What is going on is that the, the brain monitor, the neuro monitor, this is neurotechnology, is just monitoring what's happening in your brain. And it's totally passive, right? We don't even know it's there. So what good does it do us? Well, it doesn't do any good at that point until it comes time for a reactive monitoring. So let's say in a car situation, uh, you're starting to fall asleep, you're getting drowsy. Then it becomes reactive because at that point, we've developed an algorithm that vibrates your seat when you start getting drowsy. It'll vibrate your seat to try to alert you and then it'll put the warning up on your console saying, you're getting drowsy, it's time to pull off or get some coffee wake yourself up. And then it gets more aggressive. If you refuse to change your behavior, it reacts again and says, you really need to pull off. And then it'll put a coffee cup up on the screen or maybe even shoot a coffee scent into the car so that we're kind of trying to, to get your behavior to change so you don't injure anyone. That's reactive uh, monitoring. And then we have active monitoring. And that's the one that I'm really interested in when we're training you with neurotechnology to make you smarter. Now, obviously, if we're using it in a vehicle, I'm not trying to make you smarter at that point. All right, this is for safety. Although we do have mindfulness applications that will be used in vehicles, relaxation applications and so forth, that'll be done right through that headrest and you'll be able to control objects on the console by mind alone using active monitoring. So I hope we get the sense now of what passive monitoring is, it just listens doesn't do anything until we need it to do something, all right? And if we need it to do something, then it becomes reactive monitoring, so I'm trying to change the behavior. Active monitoring is the field that we'll be most interested in here because active monitoring is the act of training you to improve your brain function. And this is super, super important. Um, the fact that we do are able to have active monitoring is used in the, the play attention, um, the play attention system that I developed um, a long time ago and has mo been modified um, to be incredibly uh, modernized uh, for use now. Uh, and pioneering this uh, for uh, home use was another thing that we did when we developed play attention to develop neurotechnology to be used by people at home to improve their function, brain function. Active monitoring is the key there and I'm going to go into that in a little bit more detail. But I do want to give you just a quick pop quiz. Here is a, uh, a monitoring device that almost all of us use uh, every once in a while, right? If I stand on that, can anyone tell me uh, what type of monitor that is? Is it a passive monitor, uh, a reactive monitor, or is it an active monitor? Can anyone tell me? All right, good. If you If you had said, it is a passive monitor, it would be. Uh, that is, if I stand on it, it tells me something, but I don't do anything. I just say, okay, I'm overweight. <laughs> and that's it, right? So if I had a Snickers bar in my hand, right? And it came up and it said, oh, you weigh 300 pounds, uh, 350 pounds, and then I took my Snickers bar and I threw it against the wall in the bathroom, well, then it would be reactive monitoring because it helped me shape my behavior, at least temporarily, right? 
So it's a passive monitor, right? Um, it is. It could be reactive if it makes me change my behavior. But we use these type of monitors. The, uh, the great thing about neurotechnology is it allows us to get to that organ that is our, our chief commander, our central processing unit that really stores everything that we are and helps us make it stronger, make it uh, smarter and so forth. So as I said previously, active monitoring is really what we wanna talk about today because it is the tool we use to help you uh, improve brain function. Active monitoring is used so that when you're ready to play an activity that's going to increase your brain function, it forces you to engage with that activity. All right. As a matter of fact, we use typically what's called a go, no go scenario. In other words, if you're engaged to this particular activity that may be increasing your working memory, your spatial memory, your short term memory, your time on task, your motor skills. What neurotechnology does is forces your engagement to it. In other words, if I'm trying to teach you, and this is what the way I designed these games back in the uh, 1990s when we found out that neurotraining and cognitive training could be linked to improve human function, I knew that if I could get you to be solely engaged in this through your most direct attention, that I could teach you faster, I could teach you to become better quicker, and I could improve deficits that you might have in attention or inability to stay on task, memory, and so forth. And that has been proved true. I'll go into that in a little bit more detail uh, later on. Then we also use challenges through immediate feedback, right? So not only are we forcing you to engage with this with your highest level of attention, but we are going to challenge you through that. So as you get good at doing the task that we give you, let's say we're going to improve your uh, uh, spatial memory. Re uh, this is spatial memory has to do with location of objects, where they are uh, in your uh, stored in your mind and how to find them once again. Uh, where are my car keys from yesterday? Where did I leave them? Where did I place them? Where, how do I get to uh, uh, my location? Spatial memory, all right? So we're, we're going to uh, learn to, to do that. I forced your engagement to it by using Neurotech. The Neurotech looks for, and this is the Neurotech we use and play attention. It's an armband that we've uh, gotten two patents on already because it is so unique that picks up a brain activity signal uh, through your body, through the arm, uh, through your ankle, uh, and we pick that up uh, so that we look for you. It constantly monitors you to get your most, your best state of uh, performance and attention, and it allow you to access the activity. Let's say it's the uh, spatial memory game. And if you lose that state, the spatial memory game will stop. And it says, hey, I need you to be at your best when you're doing this. And so you put yourself back in that state. Because as many of you know who practice mindfulness or meditation, or you try to become an expert at something, you'll practice for a, a half a minute, maybe two minutes or so, and then your mind drifts off a little bit. Then you try to come back, and then you are looking at some at your task, but you're not doing anything with it. And you wake up a couple of minutes into that and you go, I have to get back to this. I have to have to be engaged. Whereas the neurotech device will tell you when you are engaged or not engaged. Make sense so far? So we force that engagement so that you're in a peak state when you're doing it. Then we challenge you. And here's how the challenge works. As you are doing the activity, we give you just that little push to engage a fraction more. Right? And this is all done through uh, active monitoring and the challenge feature that we put into the practice. Because if I let you go on autopilot, I know you're not going to learn very much. You'll just get to a point where you're like, oh, okay, I got it. But if I push you to the edge, challenge you, then you have to adjust. And your brain has to adjust to a higher degree of engagement. Now, what does that mean? That means when you are challenged, that your brain will adjust. And when it adjusts internally, 
it has to not only use more energy, but it also has to reroute wiring to make this happen. And the brain is incredibly plastic. And plastic here, neuroplasticity is the general term, is, it, is the term that's used to describe that the brain is in, incredibly moldable, shapeable. The more challenge we give it, the more it adjusts and shapes to that challenge. And that's what we're doing by forcing the engagement to your activity and then challenge you, you to do just a wee bit more and to keep you engaged by doing that. And then when you get good at that level, it may be within that uh, activity itself, it will challenge you again. If ever you can't meet the challenge, the algorithm is designed not to let you fail. So it will back off, let you go to your last best state of engagement, and then it will push you more. So what do we know? We know that when we do these things, the brain will shape itself. And it shapes itself for those people who are in academia here uh, through the Krebs cycles and their kin, C-R-E-B, cyclic amp response elements and binding proteins. In other words, we know by doing these things on a macro level, that on the micro level, we can force the brain to adjust, to rewire. This is critical to understanding how neurotechnology actually works to make us smarter. We can affect the wiring in the brain by providing the forced engagement and then challenging you to do better. And then at the end of that, we provide a deliberate practice model, all right? Now, I wanna discuss deliberate practice because it is critical. It is not a, a term, deliberate practice is a term coined by Anders Ericsson, I think. Anders Ericsson is professor at Central Florida, a genius at human performance. He has written tomes on how people become the best they possibly can be. And that is Anders Ericsson. Uh, if you have not read what deliberate practice is and how we use it to become the best that we possibly can be, you should uh, read it. And we have implemented a deliberate practice module in everything we do, whether I'm training uh, Olympic athletes, uh, NASCAR, NASA, Da Vinci robotic surgeons, nuclear power station operators. We provide a deliberate practice module in this as well, all right, in the training. In play attention, we use a deliberate practice model. So I wanna discuss just a moment what deliberate practice is in, in the use of neurotechnology. For those of you who play golf, practice guitar, practice an instrument, practice piano, um, what happens when you use deliberate practice is different than just regular practice. Regular practice, um, and I, I've seen this, I've been in the martial arts since I was 10, this will tell you my age, that was 51 years ago. I am a seventh degree black belt under the Kwan Mukan. I also have studied Jeet Kune Do under Bruce Lee's uh, disciples, uh, Dan Inosano, Larry Hartzell, Muay Thai, boxing, you name it. And so what we were always trying to do was get a model that would help us be as, the best we possibly could. But countless times when I was in the gym practicing, I would see people practicing the things they were very, very good at over and over and over again. But they seldom practice the things that they were not good at. Why? Because, well, in human nature, it makes me feel good because I do these things really well and I feel good because I can do them really well, so I practice them a lot. Now, what happens to all those other things I need, but they're not so good? Well, I just don't get to them. And I saw that happening all the time. Deliberate practice mandates that we don't just practice the things that we are, we get good at. We practice the things that are very difficult for us. And we set these up so that we can become very successful with them. So by setting them up, we, in deliberate practice, we set little mini goals. If you're a golfer, perhaps when you hit the golf ball, you hit it and it hooks. And you're like, oh, I'm terrible. And I just keep hitting it. I practice that over and over and over again and nothing ever changes. But if we give ourselves a little mini goal and say, well, you know what, I'm gonna change my grip and see if the ball does not keep curving. And so I change my grip just a fraction and the ball curves less. And there's a feedback, it's like, oh, it doesn't, it doesn't curve as much. 
And so I go, oh, let me change it, modify it a little bit more. And then the ball stops curving or hooking. I'm like, oh, that's it. So I set these little mini goals for myself. I get immediate feedback off the mini goal. And then I practice the newer technique that I'm not good at until I get better. Now that is, that is as simple as I can make deliberate practice because I could spend a whole webinar in deliberate practice. But that is what we use when we're using active monitoring and uh, we're, we're trying to get someone to understand how this all makes a change, right? Um, how I can force the engagement, I can provide challenge. I set these little mini goals and give immediate feedback to get you where I need your brain to go to improve. This is done in play attention constantly. As a matter of fact, uh, this is a game for time on task in play attention. And I'll describe how these elements work here, right? Number one, in order to, your goal, by the way, is to take all of the crates. There are numerous crates over here. If you can see my mouse cursor, there are numerous crates. Your goal is to get in a peak performance state and drive this forklift driver with your mind. So as you engage, you can make the driver go over and pick up a crate, stack it on the forklift, and then stack it on the truck over here. If you lose your active engagement, the forklift driver will just stop and wait for you to get back to an active state. So you're never allowed to take minutes before you re-engage. It's seconds or less than half a second before you re-engage and your mind is back on track. Right. So your overall goal is to stack all of the crates. You'll build up to it gradually. You'll do as many as you can until you get fatigued. And then when you come back, there's a mini goal that said, hey, you did four crates today. Let's do five tomorrow. And your overall goal will be to load all of these crates on the truck and then drive the truck up off by all by mind alone. There is no keyboard in this. You simply are using your mind to control it. So we force your engagement to activate it. And then as you're in it, we actually amp it up just a little bit. We ramp up your challenge level so that you have to be engaged just a little bit more. And then there's deliberate practice here. Because if I'm unable to do this, if I'm unable to um, do it well, what I can do is come back the next time, set another mini goal, uh, let's say that uh, one of my challenges was I fatigue after getting three crates on the truck. I'm too tired. I have to stop. Well, there's no problem. We'll stop. But the next time we play, we have this artificial intelligence built in to play attention that said, hey, you loaded three, three crates in about four minutes last time. Let's come back and let's do four crates and try to do that in a little bit less time. So there's this little mini goal set for me that's in the game itself, and it's challenging me to try to complete that. And then I know what it takes for me now to engage because I've been practicing this active engagement. And so I'm getting these little challenges and then I'm getting the deliberate practice module on top of that. And that's all embedded in play attention. And every game that we have ever done, every scenario um, we have ever worked with, whether it's for Da Vinci, we train Da Vinci robotic surgeons at three, uh, university-based hospitals now, um, nuclear power operators, NASA and supersonic flight simulation training. All of these were done with uh, neurotechnology that in incorporated um, peak engagement with um, challenge and deliberate practice. So in play attention, they actually studied uh, what happened. And this was Tufts University School of Medicine a major medical school on the East Coast in Boston, Boston area. So they got a, a grant for a million and some dollars from the U.S. Department of Education uh, to see what play attention would do, neuro training would do against brain games, because there are a lot of people who uh, say, well, um, our brain games that you can do right on your phone and you're just looking at the game and touching some buttons. Uh, should be the same. And that's what Tufts told me originally. They felt that brain training was brain training was brain training. And I said, well, no, you're missing the most important part. Neurotechnology sets us far above just brain training. And you'll see. And uh, so here's what happened. In executive function, the students 
that were on the play attention system had significant gains in executive function. Now the brain games uh, that were played, the type that you can order online now and have subscriptions to, uh, very similar to all of those, those brain games had no real increase in executive function whatsoever. This was on an ADHD population though. I wanna qualify that by saying this was among an ADHD population in the Boston uh, schools. And it was a large number. There were 109 students in this uh, program. There was also another group that got no intervention as a control group, and they didn't have executive function increases. In attention, play attention scored significantly higher abilities to control their attention. Brain games, no. Non-intervention group, none. Play attention and behavioral control, the ability to self-regulate, which is a sign of good executive function, play attention had significant increases. Brain games, none. Non-intervention group, none. No increase in medication for the play attention folks. Uh, in the brain games, if you look down at the bottom, this tells you how significant this brain training is. The average Ill in increase in medication between the brain game and non-intervention group was about nine milligrams on average. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in this, uh, by the way, this is very important. In order to even stay in school under their doctor's order, the students in the brain uh, game training group and the non-intervention group had to, on average, increase their Ritalin dosage by nine milligrams. And you see there's no increase in the medication in the play attention group because they were increasing their brain function. Now, these are documented pilot study, long-term study, and then they went back six months later after no intervention had been um, undertaken in those six months. They wanted to see if there was some type of perseverance, whether they actually maintained their ability to do all of these things they learned. And they did. So all of those are published in three peer-reviewed journals and uh, they're accessible online. I think we may have some of them on the Play Attention website as well. So let's kind of recap what we've got as far as what neural monitors can, can do for us. One, uh, they can increase our ability to stay attentive. We can also work on meditation, the ability to uh, control our brain enough so that we don't have this constant chattering and uh, anxiety and nervousness and, and stress, and that we can also learn through meditation to relax. To learn to relax and enjoy what we have in life. Don't have to let the chatter go on and make our life miserable. We can learn to control that as well. Cognitive load is something we talk about quite a bit in the automotive industry. Um, when the brain, uh, you can think of the brain as a uh, processor. When you put load on the processor, uh, it means that other things have to be suspended somewhat. Uh, for example, um, when we're driving and then we try to take our cell phone, let me grab the phone here, we take our cell phone and we're going like this and we're driving with our elbows and we're trying to text at the same time. Do you know that's more dangerous than drunk driving? So if you do that, stop. It is more dangerous than drunk driving. Your eyes are off the road for at least five seconds minimum. And your brain is divided between trying to drive and trying to input information into this phone. Supremely dangerous, don't do it. That's cognitive load. The brain can only do so many things at once. We can task switch readily. I, I can do this project, stop it, do this project, come back to this project later. But if I try to do them all at the same time, like driving and talking um, on the cell phone or driving and trying to text on the cell phone, the probability of me getting in, a, in an accident is extraordinarily high. The brain is not good at multitasking. We can do it, but almost every study I've ever read over the last 20 years said you don't do it as effectively if you're trying to multitask, as if you stayed with one task, task switched, and went to another task. That's cognitive load. Peak performance, how to get myself in a performance state uh, where I am and performing the best I possibly can. 
And we have done this with US bobsled and luge, uh, as well as nuclear power operators. Mindfulness. Many of you are probably familiar with this term. It's a hot topic right now. We actually have it in Play Attention. We also sell a, a version to high-end spas. Uh, mindfulness, being in the moment, right? And oddly enough, I introduced this concept to the automotive industry about two years ago, maybe three, with using the headrest. And I said, we should be doing it in car, in the vehicle. And they said, Peter, I don't understand why we would use this in a vehicle. And I said, mom or dad are is sitting outside waiting for their child to come out of karate class or dance lessons or soccer practice or a swim meet. And they're sitting in the car waiting for them to come out. I've answered all my emails. Wouldn't it be nice if we gave a person a way to enrich their life in the vehicle and practice mindfulness, meditation, relaxation, through the headrest, controlling this app right in front of them? And the automakers three years ago looked at me and said, I don't see it. I don't get it. And they chuckled. Oddly enough, this year in January, I was approached by four automakers, one uh U.S., one um, German, and two Japanese automakers said, you know what? We see the future in vehicles, especially in the last few years of manual driving turning to automated or autonomous driving. Uh, we see this as a way that we can enrich the lives of the people in our car and tell them we understand that you need this and we're going to give it to them. And they asked me to create them for them. So that tells you how important it is to be mindful. And mindfulness, you know, we try it on our own. We try to be mindful and be in the moment. And then we come back to it five minutes later going, oh, I was just thinking about my bills and what I was going to cook for dinner tonight. Oh, I got to get back to mindfulness. Mindfulness, when we're using neurotechnology, either the headrest or the armband, we can actually monitor in real time. If I go off task, it encourages me to get right back on task. Not five minutes later, but within a second later. Make sense? We monitor human emotion. I'm working on that right now for automotive. We have a full um, way to monitor sleep in automotive as well. We actually, in uh, Freer Logic, we've actually developed applications to help you go to sleep. We call them the Sleepy Series, Sleepy Beach, Sleepy Country, Sleepy City, all right? And they will help put you to sleep, much like my webinar right now is helping you to go to sleep. I'll try to keep, uh, keep you interested uh, as we're talking here. Uh, distraction and, and attention, this is related to attention, but we also look at that in vehicle because there's a lot of engineered distraction in a, in a car. And again, as I told you, we have worked with in training, not only ADHD, autism, and uh, dementia, cognitive decline, but we have worked with NASA and supersonic flight simulation training, NASCAR pit crews put on lug nuts faster, Olympic bobsled and luge to uh, train them faster because it takes about, uh, let's see, I think it, in the past it took up to nine years to be able to become an elite driver in an Olympic event. And now we've brought that down to three years. Nuclear power operators so that they had fewer errors. Human errors, usually the major cause of problems at nuclear reactors. So they wanted to help in keeping that mitigated. Da Vinci robotic surgeons at medical schools so that they can train their students to be as, as effective as the instructors in a quicker amount of time. So can neurotech make you smarter? I think you know by now it absolutely can, but it has to be used intelligently. There has to be uh, intelligence behind the neurotechnology to make you smarter. And that's what uh, we have done I don't know, for many, many years at uh, both Unique Logic and Technology, the uh, makers of Play Attention and at Freer Logic, my uh, other company that we work in advanced neurotech on as well. I hope uh, I've answered uh, most of your questions. I know some of you probably have some, so uh, I'll answer those in just a second. If you would like uh, a call from Play Attention or to schedule a consultation, um, please just type your phone number in and we will get back to you very shortly. Um, type the word webinar in if you would like to attend uh, Thursday's Play Attention webinar. 
And then for those of you who are professionals that have to work from a distance and because now is the time that we're all working from a distance, uh, Play Attention also has an iLab feature where you can work remotely with clients. If they have an internet connection, they can be anywhere around the globe and you can work with them. And it's much like the Zoom presentation. We can have a full video chat in iLab. We can text each other. I can see what your data are. I can see multiple students at one time. It is, we created this to be of assistance uh, for folks uh, who have to work remotely. And uh, so if you, uh, if you have remote therapy going and you need help doing it at this point, iLab and Play Attention, they're ideal. To use that, things that I need to answer. All right. Um, oh, okay. Now there are some good questions here. And let me just address these now. Um, Hugo asks, can you talk about microcurrents applied to specific parts of your brain to improve learning, impulse control, et cetera? So there is, uh, um, there are devices that you can connect to your head. Now they're, they're not monitors at all like we're talking about and they don't really train anything. But what they do is uh, they pass a minute electric current into the brain. Now theoretically, this stimulates the brain um, to me, it's just very invasive. I don't want anything pumped. I don't want currents pumped into my brain, but they, they are available um, and they do talk about uh, improving uh, symptoms. Um, and I'm not uh, fully versed on what symptoms they apply, but I think people are saying, well, if I pump these currents in my head at night, I feel better the next day. And uh, to me, um, unfortunately, as an educator, as uh, a neurotechnologist, uh, to me, I, it makes sense to use technology where I actually have set goals that I want to achieve uh, that aren't just going to float into my head by osmosis. So it's an interesting concept um, and something that uh, um, is fairly easy to do, although the outcomes for me are still um, uh, not entirely clear at all as to what pumping electricity into your head uh, would be doing. Um, so Ecu says, uh, the play attention system, best for smaller children. We have um, anywhere from age five up to age 105 using play attention. And we've had people with uh, ADHD, autism spectrum, dementia, Alzheimer's. And we have had letters that have made my staff cry from people who uh, had early onset dementia or Alzheimer's who were barely able to speak at that time, had totally withdrawn in some cases. And they wrote us letters after using it um, enough to make my staff cry and me tear up. I, it is so compelling when you see people pull back from the dark and they actually have their brains recaptured, their brains. And there was, uh, we brought one system to uh, my in-laws, my wife's family, uh, her mother and father uh, are at a retirement community. We brought one there because there was a fellow who had a stroke, totally withdrawn, was a bridge player. And um, the results were so amazing that the local newspaper came in and uh, did an interview. I think we actually even have that article. It's quite phenomenal. So it's not just me talking. Obviously, there has been a lot of testing behind it, a lot of uh, people who have used it. All right. Um, Scott Baird said, I'm very happy with my Play Attention program. It is working for me, thanks. Thank you, Scott, for being here and taking a look. Um, and have we had any issues with LED bulbs causing interference to the brain signal? Um, we have not, as far as training is concerned, but LED uh, using screens um, prior to bed, uh, there should be a big gap. Um, you should not use uh, uh, blue light and those kind of things because they do disrupt your sleep patterns. So it's very, very important to understand that uh, LED uh, screens cause a disruption and the light causes it. So you shouldn't have them on in the room. If you have your laptop next to the bed, in other words, close it. If you have your cell phone, turn it off. Other LED fixtures in the bed disrupt uh, sleep patterns. This is a known issue. 
So uh, yeah, that's a very good question, by the way. All right, Georgia, if you use a, a monitor like play attention to improve cognition or cognitive or executive function, do you have to use it throughout your entire life to maintain optimal performance? Oh, that's a really good question. and something I really didn't address. No, you don't have to use it. When you make changes to the brain, they become permanent. And I think I mentioned that uh, obtusely when we were talking about the data from Tufts University School of Medicine. When they went back six months later after the students having done nothing except go to school, no play attention training after they were finished, did they score on those tests the same as they scored previously when they were working on play attention? And the answer was yes. They maintained their ability that they had uh, learned through play attention. So this is lifelong learning. It's not just something that happens and then all of a sudden we get bad at it again. Because it's constantly reinforced by um, the fact that we're using it on a daily basis, whether it's at school, at work, or at home, or in my personal relationships. Super important. Good questions. I have more here. Uh, Sharon asks, now that we have moved to a 55 plus community, I wanna rebuild my practice. Hey Sharon, I remember. I, I hope everything's going well down in Florida. Uh, what tools are available to assist me in doing this? Will seniors attend the games? Uh, where can I find research to jumpstart this new direction? All of that we can take care of for you. Uh, we have fantastic uh, opportunities, especially with iLab if you're doing it remotely. And uh, if you would just call in and we'll make certain that you are taken care of um, and make certain you have all the tools you need, definitely. All right, Fuang, um, per, Fuang uh, asks, does the play attention game target brain systematically or is it more specific? Uh, working memory and how long the student use the programs to get a no noticeable gain? That's a really good question. And uh, Fuang, uh, pardon me if I am butchering your name. I'm, I'm hoping I'm getting it close. Um, the games, and this is a really good question because there is no magic on switch and all of a sudden the student is fixed. Everybody learns at a different rate. And so we are, we are challenging the student with specific uh, activities that address executive function, uh, working memory, short-term memory, spatial memory, uh, time on task, discriminatory processing, um, motor skills, fine motor skills, uh, and there's actually far more than that. Um, so they, we, we approach it by finding out where that student has the greatest weaknesses and then customizing the training according to that student's particular needs. Now, how long will it take them to achieve noticeable gains? We'll see minor gains over the first 30 days. Now they're not permanent by any means. You have to practice them obviously long enough so that they are long-term gains. So we're looking at uh, three quarters of a year to a year, and then we wean off of the program because we have it. So we don't wanna make, I do wanna make certain you understand that this is not the quick fix. Right, and that's what everybody wants. We don't even like waiting for our microwave popcorn. We don't even like standing outside the microwave for two minutes while it's, uh, you know, popping in the microwave. We want it now. And there is nothing in the brain that's going to be done now. It will start very quickly, but you have to stay with it. That's the truth. If anybody tells you they can miraculously uh, fix your brain uh, overnight, they're absolutely fibbing to you. It doesn't happen. It requires work. I remember when I did a Good Morning America, they asked me on, I showed them play attention, and um, one of the, the mom that they got, you know, they told her about this type of training. She goes, I'm not doing that, but my kids after school? No, there's no way. So there is some sacrifice involved, and that's the truth. You have to be able to put in the time and the effort and look at what you're going to get long-term, invest in yourself uh, to make these changes because you can make significant changes. We've proven it over and over again. We're the leaders, we're doing it now in the auto industry as well. It is uh, an incredible future with incredible hope for all of us, but it doesn't come immediately and it takes work to get there. And that's you know what we're doing with Play Attention. So I, I think, uh, I hope that makes sense. Um, you mentioned a little bit about iLab. Does this mean that the play attention clients 
can work from home during the social distancing time? Uh, would they have to have their own armband? That's from Danella. Yes, so they can work from home. You can actually see them just like you're seeing me, talk back and forth, coach them, uh, see their brain data in real time, see their game data in real time. That's all I lab, and you can't, but they do have to have the armband there. You would have to lease them an armband or they can purchase one from us uh, so that they have the program and you have to have the master monitor. Quick questions, wow. Hugo, how should one cycle through all the various play attention games to achieve the best result? Uh, when you get play attention, what they'll do is uh, you, you can actually get assessment tools from play attention, which will show the greatest strengths that your child or your student, your client has, and the greatest weaknesses. So then we customize the game, uh, the games that they need around that. So we have this really good idea, it's personalized, that what this person needs to really function well, and that's, they'll help you decide what that student particular needs are. I hope that makes sense, right? Um, thank you, Sharon. Uh, Deborah. how long does it need to be used? Days, months, years? All right, and I think I've kind of answered that. Everyone's different. Some people take as little as half a year and they're good. Some people take up to about a year and then you wean off of it. So it, it doesn't take years and years and years. And you'd be surprised how quickly this goes. One of the great things about this is once you start using it for a month or two and you start to see uh, the differences that it makes, the incredible improvements that are there, all of a sudden you're like, who is this person in front of me that I never knew before? These changes are fantastic. They're small at first, but I see them. We are there. And then hope is up. Hope springs up and you know, I know we can do this. And we do. We haven't been here for 26 years because we don't work. We are, have been here because this is a fantastic tool. All right, what does the home system include? Uh, the home system includes two user licenses. So that means if uh, dad has the problem and, mom, and uh, child has the problem, the two of you can use it. If you need to get those licenses bumped up, we can do that. And by the way, if you need an additional license for three people, let's say you've got two children and dad or mom that want to use it, uh, let me just tell you right now, I'll authorize the staff to give you up to three uh, licenses for free so that it doesn't cost you any more money. And uh, that way, you know, we can accommodate everybody for you at home. Uh, okay. Nina asks, Thursday webinar, webinar for play attention uh, and how it works a bit more than today? Yes, um, good question. Thursday's play attention webinar will show you all the workings of play attention. And they'll talk to you a little bit about what I've talked to you about as far as uh, executive function, but they're going into it in greater detail to show you exactly how all of that works together. It's an, an incredible program. I know you'll be impressed. It's been around for a long time in various forms and it's in a, the form that it's in right now is very exciting, a lot of fun. And let's see, Will, what is your armband monitoring? The armband is monitoring neural activity. So it's not the same as EEG, although it is in the same bandwidth as EEG. Uh, we pull up uh, delta, theta, alpha, and beta one, beta two. And that is what it is monitoring. It's those same ones. Uh, Samsung did research on the armband and they compared it to an eight channel EEG device. And uh, they found really interesting results. So they uh, used an attention algorithm on the eight channel clinical EEG device that's attached to a person's head. And they put this on the student's arm at the same time and they made them practice attention. And so they looked at the results with the eight channel EEG, it got a 91% correlation. And then they looked at the armband from a single channel device. This is single channel as opposed to an eight channel device. And they got an 86% correlation to attention. And then Dr. Kim, who was in charge of that from Samsung said, well, that's not fair because 91% is the composite of all eight channels. What do they that eight? What does that eight channel get on a single channel? It was the same score as body wave for a clinical device on the head, as my body wave device on the arm. I hope that makes sense to you as well. It's very effective. You know, people just don't like putting stuff on um, 
on the head. They don't like pasting electrodes. They don't like wearing silly looking gadgets. Um, and an armband we put on for our, our iPods, if we even use those anymore, or our cell phones so we can listen to our tunes as we jog or walk and that kind of thing. All right, Pamela asking is asking, what is the price range? The price range varies, depends. We have a global audience, so I can't quote a price right now because you know some people are in areas that get charged from a distributor there over in the Middle East and some are here from South Africa. Some are here from Europe and some from Asia as well. So I can't tell you what they'll charge you in that area. However, if you call in, they will give you all the pricing information that you need. All right. Um, all right. Thank you, Sharon. We can have a chat. No problems. Be delighted to chat with you. Be good after so many years. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. I am so grateful. Um, Anne asks, are you able to identify characteristics of individuals who are more likely to be successful, uh, succeed with, with change? Um, and I'm not really certain I understand the question. If you could rephrase it while I'm <clears throat> finishing out, I don't really understand the question. Um, so I'll, if you can rephrase, I'll try to answer that. Uh, remember there are, um, the webinar is on Thursday, and then there's another iLab webinar for all the professionals here who want to do teletherapies. Um, you'll see that on Friday. Um, just put, uh, type in uh, iLab, and uh, if you type iLab in, they'll send you information about how to attend the webinar. That's Friday, iLab. If you want it, just type in iLab, and we'll make certain all of you uh, get notification for that as well. And then Thursday is the full play attention one. Um, I, you know, I'm just uh, not able to do full play attention uh, on this one because it was neurotechnology. And that gives you the foundation uh, of play attention and how we uh, uh, work. Uh, ZZ said, can the armband be used with a tablet yet? It can be used with Microsoft um, Surface Pros. I, think that's the limitation to it, yet I don't think uh, it works for an iPad one. If any of my staff is here and can uh, update me on that as well, that would be appreciated. Uh, it has to have uh, an OS on it. So other than uh, it will work on um, Microsoft Surface Pro that runs Windows. If uh, you have an iPad that has a full uh, Apple OS on it, um, it, it, it should work cannot be an Android. Uh, we don't have it for Android right now uh, yet. <clears throat> so just about any, any laptop would run it. Uh, okay. Um, I think we're out of questions and I really appreciate it. Everyone here, please stay well. Remember that you can control your future and how your brain functions. And we do have hope. There is hope for change. And we are here to support you through all of that. So stay healthy. Thank you so much. And then uh, please uh, feel free to come to Thursday's webinar or iLab if you want. Uh, type in the word iLab and my folks will get in touch with you. Thanks again. Take care, everyone. It's really been great. And I love Zoom. All right. Take care. We will uh, talk to you soon.